signs of springtime are easy to spot. There are daffodils, bros in shorts way too early, European tourists drinking wine at 9 a.m., and an insane number of shows vying to open really close to the Tony Award eligibility deadline in order to be fresh in the minds of nominators. A group of 48 powerful and gorgeous people whom I happen to love very much. Broadway.com is celebrating the spring season with a look at the stars and new shows bowing on the Great White Way. It's showtime for Alex Brightman and Sophia Ann Caruso, who are getting ready to star in the new musical Beetlejuice, based on the cult favorite 1988 movie of the same name. That's the year I was born. There are ghosts, exorcism, and a whole lot of swearing, or as I like to call it, Thursday. Brightman and Caruso explain why Beetlejuice has to be experienced to be believed. Beetlejuice follows the story of Lydia and her, her journey through grief and loss and also has this crazy demon who comes and creates a mischief and then we create some mischief together. I think people are going to come expecting Tim Burton's story, the uh, wackiness, the aesthetic, that's all there. But the story that we're telling is one of how people deal with grief. And it also focuses on a young person dealing with grief, which That's you don't right. see very often. People don't really pay attention to young people who are grieving. They don't think that we grieve. Right. My first experience seeing Beetlejuice was as a kid. I watched the movie religiously. I was a huge fan before I even got this script in my hands. Watching the movie recently, once like this became a thing, you realize that this was such a huge thing for Tim Burton. This was his way of getting his aesthetic out there. Although the new musical is an adaptation from the cult classic movie, Brightman and Caruso are confident that even the biggest Beetlejuice fans will find something new to love. I will say that we have a lot of things that the hardcore fans are gonna like, they're gonna die, like yes. they're gonna die. But we also have our own spin on it. So mm -hmm. it's like all of those things, but with each individual actor's little touch. It's not just like a campy comedy. It also has like a beautiful story and a beautiful like message that's actually like so important, which you don't get in a lot of these big flashy musicals. There are references to other Tim Burton properties in this. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely reference things in the movie. This is like the best possible fan fiction for Beetlejuice you can see. The duo has been working together for three years and the magic of creating a new musical is still brewing. None of this gets old because it is everything that, I, as a theater nerd and dork, want, I want to do. I moved to New York to be a leading lady on Broadway. That's what I always said when I moved here. That was my mantra every day. And it's like living my, you know, my you know, kid dream. Come on, don't say that louder. It's your kid dream. It's mine I'm too. I'm living my childhood dream. Me too, I'm living my childhood dream. Beetlejuice begins performances at the Winter Garden Theater on March 28th. Titus Andronicus is perhaps Shakespeare's darkest, bloodiest tragedy. So naturally, Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus by Taylor Mack, is promising audiences big laughs. This may just be the funniest show about cleaning up a pile of corpses you've ever seen. You don't need to know anything about Titus Andronicus. That's the wonderful thing about the play. It's, I'm not really interested in Titus Andronicus. I mean, I shouldn't say that. It's probably probably shut a lot of people off from coming. But I'm, I'm less interested in Titus Andronicus as I am in what happens after. The Shakespeare tragedy ends with a famous bloody banquet scene and a stage full of corpses. I was thinking, well, who has to clean up? <laughs> so I just wanted to write a play about the people that have to come and clean up the banquet. And a lot about them, this metaphor, using a metaphor for what's happening right now in the culture and big messes, political messes being created, and who's going to have to come and clean up? And do those people benefit from the cleanup or do they not? Do they have to do it over and over and over again every time people in power decide to make a mess? It's something that you don't see that much on Broadway. Uh, you see a lot of middle class, upper middle class and wealthy uh, people talking about you know, their lives and ideas. And I thought the most exciting thing about Gary to me is that it's about these <laughs> two working class people trying to figure out how to live in the world. Although Mac is a celebrated performer himself, both in and out of drag, he's thrilled to sit back and see Julie White, Christine Nielsen, and Nathan Lane as Gary premiere the show.
I hope that thousands of people play Gary, ultimately, you know? And uh, it's the kind of role that doesn't have to be a man or a woman. It could be a 20-year-old or an 80-year-old that plays the part, you know, I'll never age out of the part. So I, I would kind of see it and I go, oh, well, I'd like to play that role one day, you know? I like that Nathan is, I mean, to have Nathan be the first person, you know, is pretty special. He's just remarkable. Broadway audiences can expect big laughs from Gary, but it's inspired by the not-so-funny state of the world. I gave myself a challenge with the play that I would try to put all the horrible things in the world on one stage and see if I could make something good out of it. So that's what Gary is. And it's not so much the result, but the attempt. It's that you get to come and watch somebody try to make something good instead of watching all these people trying to make something bad, <laughs> which is, feels like the political system right now. Gary, a sequel to Titus Andronicus, opens at the Booth Theater on April 11th. Apparently, you get to eat chili and cornbread during intermission of the 75th anniversary production of Oklahoma. So, enough said. Say more? Okay. Uh, Daniel Fish's reimagined staging has pioneer women Mary Testa, Rebecca Naomi Jones, and Ali Stroker gearing up for an intimate revival. But also cornbread and chili. I think what is so cool about this production is that it can speak to a 2019 audience. Mm -hmm. And the show was written 75 years ago, and it was relevant then, and it's relevant now. For these three strong actresses, the staging by visionary director Daniel Fish is shining a light on the darker shades of the classic 1943 musical, which tells the story of pioneers settling out west. There's a lot of misogyny in this script, and the women, particularly in this production, I think come off stronger than the men. And I don't mean that acting-wise, I mean that the women make their decisions, and the women choose what they want. They're not forced into anything, so I think that it's really, the light shines, one of the things in this production shines a light on that. And I feel like really lucky to be doing this show at this time mm -hmm. in history where people are listening to the women. You can, you can come and you will really hear these women's voices. As the show's romantic female leads, Rebecca Naomi Jones and Ali Stroker are making history with their boundary-breaking casting. Stroker as an actress in a wheelchair playing sexually adventurous Ado Annie, and Naomi Jones playing classic ingenue Laurie as an actress of color. There's a version of me being cast as Lori in which I sort of have to like pretend I am that ingenue we're all picturing, you know, pretend I'm like Shirley Jones or something. You know, it's like that's the version that I would have grown up in, with in my head is like one day I'll play that character and in my brain I'm sort of playing like a blonde white woman, you know? <laughs> but in our version, I feel like I am welcome to the table in the skin that I am in, which is which is great. I'm so excited <laughs> and, you know, and to address sexuality and disability without having to talk about it, mm -hmm. but we're just with it. Mm -hmm. And that is totally on brand with this show. Yeah. When I go to the theater, I want to be moved. I want to sit forward. I don't want to be entertained. I want to be challenged and moved. And I think this is what Oklahoma's going to do for people. I hope anyway. Oklahoma starts performances March 19th at the Circle in the Square Theater. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com Spring Preview brought to you by Masterpass. Buy tickets to all the best and brightest new shows with Masterpass on Broadway.com. The new play Hillary and Clinton shows an alternate universe in which Hillary Clinton wins the U.S. presidency. That's not what it's about. Oh, okay. Zach Orth plays campaign manager Mark Penn in this dream world, alongside a dream cast. Lori Metcalf and John Lifko as Hill and Bill, Peter Francis James as Barack, and Laura Benanti as Melania. Think about it. Hillary and Clinton is about uh, the 2008 uh, New Hampshire primary, and it takes place in sort of a parallel universe. It's a planet Earth very similar to our own. A woman named Hillary, whose husband Bill used to be president, is now running for president against a man named Barack. And it is this imagining of what could have been. I play Mark Penn, who was the campaign manager for the 2008 Clinton campaign. He is a foil to Bill, and it's kind of a confidant to Hillary. They're both trying to get, protect, and claim Hillary as their own. 
Even though much is still being said about the 2016 presidential election, playwright Lucas Nath is taking audiences all the way back to 2008. There are a lot of similarities between 2008 and 2016. And for Hillary Clinton, politically, and I would imagine personally and metaphysically, like she just like sort of got hit with a two by four both times. That's really ripe for a, a really good play. The Clintons have been the subject of many an impersonation, but Orth says audiences shouldn't come to the theater expecting an SNL sketch. There are no impersonations going on. What we have to say is really so rich and full that it would actually kind of be oddly diminished by also trying to do an impression. Orth is returning to the New York stage with some theater heavyweights, including 2018 Tony winner Laurie Metcalf. Working with Laurie Metcalf and uh, John Lithgow and Peter Francis James, I have to rein it in. Like, I have to keep my enthusiasm under control because I'm so happy about it that it, like, is actually kind of a turnoff. Like, if I let myself really uh, get all giggly about it, it's crazy great. Hillary and Clinton begins performances March 16th at the Golden Theater. The new musical Tootsie, based on the beloved 1982 movie, is about an out-of-work actor so desperate for a role, he will do absolutely anything to land a job. Alternate title, being an actor. Anyway, Santino Fontana plays Michael Dorsey, who is so sick of struggling that he takes on a female persona because it's so much easier to be a working actress. I feel like what's great about our version of Tootsie, the Broadway musical version, is that the creators and the cast have kind of ingested what the movie was, the story of it, and are now telling it current, today, bringing things up to date, and uh, setting it instead of at a soap opera, but in a Broadway musical. And it's incredibly accessible to people who don't know the story, but also people who do know the story and want to feel like they get to experience that again. You'll get that, and more. One of the reasons the creative team has updated Tootsie is views about gender have changed in the last 37 years. We have taken in everything that's going on today and acknowledged it because you have to. We can't tell a story today and not speak to the audience that's gonna be hearing it. So issues of uh, income inequality amidst the genders, all of the social issues that have been raised recently, and also just the fact that a man is defrauding people pretending to be a woman and what that actually means to women who are struggling. We address that, you have to, it's important. And it's also a great way in to tell this story in a new way that is also was always there. I would also say Tootsie is about stepping into somebody else's shoes and really understanding, or understanding a little bit better what they go through. And that's what acting is. Here's something else that acting is, getting into costume. The transformation from Michael Dorsey to Dorothy involves a lot of tape, and a lot of tricks, and a lot of straps, and elastic, and a bra, and I still don't understand the bra. I think it is a bad invention. I think there's got to be a better way. I think if men needed bras, it would be like, like, like a piece of tape or um, a spray. It takes a lot of people. It takes a village backstage to turn me into Dorothy. <laughs> it's true. Tootsie begins previews at the Marquee Theater on March 29th. Derek Baskin, James Harkness, Jawan M. Jackson, Ephraim Sykes, and Jeremy Pope are the five triple threats starring in Ain't Too Proud, the life and times of the Temptations. But the creative team behind Jersey Boys, a score powered by catchy Motown hits, and five suave sirs busting moves in suits, this new musical is one your dad won't want to miss. This is going to be the precedent for what jukebox musicals should be because it doesn't have your normal just song to song to song to song. It has a story and it has a brilliantly told one. Jukebox bio shows have become an established part of the Broadway landscape with Frankie Valli, Carol King, and Cher all seeing their life stories play out in musical form. The five stars think the story of The Temptations is a powerful one. What this show does beautifully is actually humanize what some people have made just idols or stereotypes. And this is what these men, who they were and what they went through and what they struggled with. We as black male artists relate to them. We know we stand on their shoulders. And so that makes the story uh, just more important to tell. 
Derek Baskin stars as Otis Williams, the founder of the group, but the musical is a showcase for all five triple threats. It's the best relay race that I have ever been in in my entire life. Starts with Derek, Derek has the baton and he takes off and it gets whap, 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 whap through every single person on that stage until it's handed back to Derek at wow. the end of the show. And that is what the show is like and no one drops the baton. We came up with this just wonderful energy as a group. And I think when you see the show, you'll feel that camaraderie that we have. We can't do this show without one another. There's no four, there's no three, there's no two, there's the five of us, and there's strength in that. I know that I can lean on Derek, or I can lean on Ephraim, or Juwan, you know, or James, and they have my back. Broadway's newest supergroup is ready to dazzle both OG Temptations fans and new recruits. You have a uh, part of the audience that has grown up with this music, and so their reaction for me is the most heartwarming because it takes them back to their youth. And I feel like oftentimes when we're on stage singing the music, like they're not necessarily hearing us, but they're hearing their memories. And so it's just so heartwarming. And then the other reaction is someone who's, uh, you know, much younger and to find uh, their uh, surprise about the contributions of this group. It's just wonderful to watch both of those uh, reactions. Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations opens at the Imperial Theater on March 21st. It's springtime on Broadway. Get tickets to all of the buzz about new musicals and plays and enjoy faster checkout with Masterpass. A struggling newspaper, underdog reporters, and a ruthless boss. No, we are not talking about today's news. In James Graham's Inc., Bertie Carville and Johnny Lee Miller tell the true story of how the tabloid newspaper The Sun got started and the drama that happened in between the lines. No fake news here. So Rupert Murdoch kind of blows in like a iconoclastic cyclone into the world of the English establishment and wants to put a bomb under it and recruits Larry Lamb, who is this kind of star centre forward who's been put out to pasture. Together they change the face of journalism forever. Carvel and Miller bring the notorious news duo to the stage in James Graham's Inc. And to do that, they leave judgments at the door. I think you'd expect a portrait of Murdoch as the scourge of the, the kind of liberal elite. I think James Graham is much more interested in a balanced portrait. When you read a play, does, does the play on the page t tick those boxes? Does it take care of its subject matter responsibly? And James's play certainly does, and I don't think it makes any uh, judgments. It tells a story in a interesting, dynamic way. The play does illustrate how much fun people had doing their job, how hard the job was, how much camaraderie there was, and how, what a physically demanding job producing a print newspaper. It's got the quality of a tabloid newspaper. It grabs your attention. It's bold and brassy. With the role of the media under attack, Murdoch's story is a perfect one to take center stage in 2019. It's about who decides how news is presented. It's about populism and about what happens when you give people what they want. By looking at the past, we can sort of think freshly about our present moment, and that's what you want a play to do, as well as being a lot of fun. Inc. starts previews at the Friedman Theater on April 2nd. Town is getting ready to take audiences to hell and back again. Tony nominee Eva Noblezada and Reeve Carney know a thing or two about being hot. You know what? I did not write that. That is offensive. And also, can I please see those two photos of them that you showed me earlier? Earlier. Hades Town is loosely based on the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice and uh, also deals with the mythology of Hades and Persephone, and it's, you know, an intertwining love story. I think this retelling of the myth kind of adds human personalities even more so to these characters, who we think are quite ethereal and um, out of reach. But I think with this, it kind of brings it back down to earth, and all of the traits that we as humans suffer with are completely parallel in these characters. Hades Town has taught me a lot. We're learning Greek mythology and history, but also just like life stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't realize Persephone's role in the uh, grand scope of the world. And I think that's a big part of our show as well. The thematic intertwining of human love and 
the way the earth functions through love. But I think it's always good to have that reminder and to realize that everything, there's life in everything and there's love in everything. Mm. With great love stories comes great responsibility, and Noblesse Ada and Carney don't take it lightly. Yeah, it's really easy to fall in love with each other every night on stage. When you have a scene partner as giving as Eva and as open, it, it, we really just are able to flow. The love story really has to be passionate and we really have to dive in there head first or else the rest of the story isn't really justified. So if audiences allow themselves to feel what Eurydice feels for Orpheus and what Orpheus feels for Eurydice and the, the song that he's working on, how Persephone feels for Hades and that long everlasting tested love, you know, wear waterproof mascara. <laughs> Hades Town begins performances at the Walter Kerr Theater on March 22nd. Most 15-year-olds sock money away scooping ice cream, babysitting, or selling their mom's Xanax. But Heidi Schreck spent her teenage years traveling around the country giving speeches about the U.S. Constitution. It's how she put herself through college. She also went to college. This overachiever is making her Broadway debut this season starring in What the Constitution Means to Me, which she also wrote. What the Constitution Means to Me is a play in which I recreate this contest I did as a teenage girl. The goal of the contest was you were supposed to draw a personal connection between your own life and the Constitution, which was impossible for me at 15. I didn't know enough about myself or about our country or about the Constitution. So I returned to the document as a woman in my mid-40s to take that prompt seriously and say, what would it mean now that I have lived through three more decades to connect my own life, my own body to this document? Shrek's mother was the one that came up with the idea for this unique money-making gig. Though she was only a teenager, she was up for the task. I wore the same suit, I believe, four years, which was this cobalt blue 80s power suit. <laughs> I remember thinking when I walked into a room that no one would assume I was smart and then I would be able to come in and pull the rug out from under them. I never could have imagined this contest would lead to my Broadway debut. Part personal exploration, part open-ended conversation, part speech, and part debate, what the Constitution means to me has a highly unique theatrical structure. Like the document itself, I am a living, growing creature, and so I keep changing and adding things to the show as we perform it. It's always going to be topical because everything that's happening in the news was created by the 300 years that preceded it. I don't want to tell people what to think. I don't want to tell people what to feel. I have deep personal questions about our Constitution and about our country and about our responsibilities as Americans. My greatest hope would be that people would feel as excited as I do to wrestle with those questions. What the Constitution Means to Me begins performances at the Hayes Theater on March 14th. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com Spring Preview brought to you by Masterpass. Buy tickets to all the best and brightest new shows with Masterpass on Broadway.com. When people talk about Lanford Wilson's 1987 play, Burn This, the word that comes up a lot is intense. After you experience this emotional play about grappling with death, isolation, friendship, art, identity, and passion, you're gonna go to a dark bar and have a glass of wine and a serious conversation. Or you're gonna go home, pay the sitter, and fall asleep in full makeup. That's up to you. Here are David Furr and Brandon Uranowitz, who star alongside Adam Driver and Carrie Russell in the Broadway revival. The play is it's about these three New Yorkers who have suffered the loss of, uh, of a friend and loved one, and they're kind of out of their comfort zone. And into that world comes a fourth person, and he's got a very explosive energy. Overall, it's about all of these individuals trying to fill a void in their lives and how they can help each other to fill those voids and how they help each other change. Yeah. And for me, it's also just about passion and about passion in love and passion in art and passion in friendships and, you know, what you're willing to risk in order to get the things that you want. Burr and Uranowitz are connected to the central character of Anna in intimate ways, one as a boyfriend and the other as a roommate. I like that it delves into friendships. I mean, there's a you know famous 
combustible relationship between the Pale and the Anna character, but it also just dives into these friendships. And that's something that I feel like doesn't get explored a lot. You know, so many people from New York City are not with their immediate family, they've moved here, and we take on chosen families, and that's very much what this is about. The playwright Lanford Wilson beautifully details features about each character in the script. Well, Lanford Wilson describes Burton as tall, athletic, good-looking screenwriter who enjoys um, talking about his work, <laughs> and he's got, he says he has big hands and feet that he admires. So, you know, typecasting, I guess, I don't know. Lamford Wilson describes Larry as bright, gay, and medium everything. Is that me? I'd say you're a little more than medium. That sounded a lot yeah, I don't sa saucier than I <laughs> intended. But. David? <laughs> Burn This begins performances March 15th at the Hudson Theater. The new musical Be More Chill asks two simple questions. What if popularity came in a pill and would you take yes. it? That was too fast. Those questions are actually not simple. They're complicated, which is the opposite of simple. Be More Chill explores them by placing audiences into a mind-trippy world with an ordinary kid at the center. Joe Iconis, the composer-lyricist, explains it all for us. Be More Chill is a show that unabashedly has a nerd hero, a principal character who is just not that special. I like to think that he sort of is one in a great line of uh, nerd heroes from musicals. For me, the sort of pinnacle of that is uh, Seymour Krelborn in A Little Shop of Horrors, which was the first musical that I ever saw. And I think because it was the first musical I ever saw, you know, for my entire career, I, I probably just keep writing Seymour over and over again. Social media may be a newer way of communicating, but Be More Chill's songs were being shared through the grapevine, just like all popular culture. It's truly word of mouth. It's truly a kid hearing a song and then being like, oh, you got to hear this song. Because of that, we have these fans that care so deeply about this show. They have ownership in the best way of the show, where they understand that we have gotten to where we are because people loved it, because people cared about it. And the fans of our show take that really seriously and they feel emboldened to be even more passionate and even more vocal about this thing that they love. With Be More Chill as his first Broadway show, Iconis is a little spoiled by the adoration before the show has even opened. As a writer, to know that my work is connecting with people, that's why I do it. It's such a ridiculously gratifying experience that I'm terrified to do any other show. Be More Chill opens on March 10th at the Lyceum Theater. The leader of a nation has three adult children who are embroiled in various crimes. People who are close to the leader end up betraying him, and he quickly becomes paranoid and insane. Huh, where have I heard that before? Oh, it's Shakespeare's King Lear! Starring Glenda Jackson in a gender-bent production directed by Sam Gold. Elizabeth Marvel, Ruth Wilson, and Ashing O'Sullivan play the Mad King's three daughters. You know, it's a fascinating play. It begins as a family drama, it's a court drama, it's a societal story, and then it sort of breaks into this cosmic examination of universal themes and really uh, takes on the biggest of all themes, which is mortality. And there are a lot of jokes. Some nudity, a bit of sex, a bit some of, great songs, um, a lot of blood, a lot of blood, lots of music, lots of, blood, lots of, blood, murder, lots of numbers. Murder. Yeah, some Good. music, great music. Although the three daughters have remained women, other key characters in the play have swapped genders. Tony winner Glenda Jackson, who played Lear in a separate 2016 London production, takes on the legendary Shakespeare role again for Broadway. Yeah, well, so in this show, we have obviously Glenda Jackson, who's playing Lear, um, and we have Jane, who Jane Dussel, Howdy who's, Shell. who's playing Gloucester, and I'm playing a fool. Um, so there's lots of females, well, the, the doubling, the gender's been reversed. It sort of feels like it's universal, these themes. I also think it's time, because I think in many ways, in the theatre, we have taken on socioeconomics, we've taken on race, but we really haven't taken on gender. And I think the beautiful thing about theatre is if you say you're the king, you're the king. It's a magic space. So we can move past gender now 
and I think it's long overdue. Yeah, we just can't even keep up with Glenda Jackson. She's formidable. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. She's really a is. beast. Yeah. yeah. She walks in in a combat jacket with yeah. a tin tin jumper and sort yeah. of sneakers. combat trousers and sneakers, and you're like, she's just, she's very cool, and she's, she's a beast. And we're sort of thinking we won't be able to keep up with. I mean, she's going to do eight shows a week of this, and she's, she's so good. Not it even in the bag. break a sweat. Yeah. So, what can this 400-year-old play illuminate for audiences in 2019? What can't it illuminate? It's like the greatest play that's ever been written by the greatest playwright the world has ever known. It, 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 it goes beyond what's happening now. It deals a little bit with what's happening now in our world, but it goes into the, the meaning of existence and non-existence and love. I mean, you realise that humans repeat the same mistakes over and over again, and that's, that, that's what it is to be human. And, and that it's all impermanent. And that it's all beautiful. And all lovely. of it is beautiful. And horrifying. Yeah, and even and the horrible. ugly is beautiful. And, and ends in yeah, slaughter yeah. and death and suffering. Yeah, yeah, that's all beautiful. King Lear begins performances at the Court Theatre on February 28th. It's springtime on Broadway! Get tickets to all of the buzz about new musicals and plays and enjoy faster checkout with Masterpass. Oscar nominee Annette Bening and Tony winner Tracy Letts lead the fourth Broadway revival of Arthur Miller's classic play, All My Sons. As Kate and Joe Keller, the all-star actors grapple with a long-held family secret in post-World War II Ohio. Letts, a fantastic playwright and actor, sat down to talk about how the newest staging takes on the American dream. All My Sons is a play by Arthur Miller, uh, written in 1947, three-act family drama. I play Joe Keller, who's the head of the family. Roundabout asked me if I wanted to play Joe Keller in All My Sons, and I, I just said, I, I don't know how you call yourself an actor if you don't do that. Uh, like, I have to do that. It's a great, great American play. A Pulitzer Prize and Tony-winning playwright himself, Letts is a huge admirer of the writing of Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller is a true dramatist. Uh, he dramatizes uh, situations for the theater, for the stage, in a way that's very theatrical and very relatable. I think it's one of the great things about Miller's plays and in all, about All My Sons in particular, the idea that characters represent larger social forces than just themselves, but at the same time they exist as real people. There are probably a lot of ways to read Joe Keller through a modern lens, but he certainly, among other things, he represents the idea that one's responsibility is only to oneself or to one's family and not to the world beyond it, and that's really what the play concerns itself with. He also represents the classic uh, capitalist idea, the importance of business and money. Is your responsibility just to yourself? Is it to your family? Is it to your neighbor? Is it to your country? Is it to the world? It seems like a very important conversation to be having right now. Letts and his wife, actress Carrie Coon, became parents last year, which the actor says adds an emotional layer to the portrayal of patriarch Joe Keller. You know, today was the first time I've read a play since I've become a father, and uh, a lot of All My Sons deals with the topic of fathers and sons. I'm going to have to try and figure a way to get through it without weeping. Uh, you can't just get up there and weep throughout the play, but it, uh, it provokes those kinds of deep feelings. Fathers and sons, it's, uh, it's deep stuff. All My Sons begins previews at the American Airlines Theater on April 4th. What do you get when you put Shakespeare, tap dancing, and Kelly O'Hara all together? My vision board! And because thoughts become things, the second revival of Kiss Me Kate, you are welcome, Broadway. With an updated storyline that defies stereotypes, Kiss Me Kate aims to leave audiences cheering. I think we do need a good yeah, old-fashioned musical comedy. Yeah. It feels really good to hit. Me. I'm, I'm in. in the head. Yeah. Yeah. Hit man. Hit. hit. Meaning me. In the Cole Porter classic, the two Broadway favorites play ex-lovers Fred Graham and Lily Vanessi, who spar offstage and on while starring in a tour of The Taming of the Shrew. For 2019, the show's creators have turned a modern eye on the musical's Battle of the Sexes. 
The, the one thing that I, as I get old, you know, you want everything to mean something. You want to say right. something, and you, you have no idea how deeply we've studied, you know, Taming of the Shrew, right. and tried to think about where we are in 2019 as opposed to 47 when this musical was written. And we want to say something, otherwise why do it? O'Hara and Chase have teamed up before and have chemistry to spare. Chemistry is always a weird word for me, because in television sometimes you have chemistry tests to see if, oh, if these people, you shoot this scene and we have to do whatever, and then I don't have to have to shoot this scene again. And if yeah. I don't like you or something, again, it makes for the work day to be weird. But theater, if I didn't like you, this would be <laughs> the worst job ever. Five weeks in a rehearsal space with somebody you don't like, on stage each night, and like you said, this trust thing, where right. I know that on a given night, or I've had a bad day, or we both have families and we have these things, that I know you've got my back, I know Kelly's got my Will's back, and I also know on the fun nights, it's gonna be really, really fun. fun. And that's the only way to do theater, I think. Yeah, but I think chemistry is also your decision. You find couples who are madly in love have no chemistry to other people on stage, or the people that they think have the most chemistry, there's zero going on right, in real right, life. Right, 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 right the case most of the time. Right, right, right. But I think that's for you to decide if you like that charm between us. What we feel is great, but we know that people can hate each other and give great chemistry. Right. So yeah. I think you can't control it. You either have right. it or you don't. Right. I mean, the hope is that you, the hope is that this is trans, this fun is translating. Are we done? I mean, he's ugly, but I, I feel like. Are we done? Can we stop this? Kiss Me Kate opens March 14th at Studio 54. Still not sure what to see? Wait, really? After learning about 14 new shows? Well, you could always head to Lincoln Center Theater and see me, Laura Benanti, in my dream role of Eliza Doolittle in the acclaimed revival of Lerner and Lowe's My Fair Lady. Did I mention it's my dream role? And it's, it's just kind of a big deal.